Hello and welcome to lecture number one. Today we will study the first of many topics which will cover a wide range of issues associated with American history. For this topic, we will investigate some of the characteristics of the first Americans, Native Americans. There are three primary themes to be addressed in this lecture. First, we will explore some of the common theories concerning the origin of Native Americans in the Western Hemisphere. Next, the lecture will survey the tremendous diversity among Indian people before and at the time of European contact. Many farmed, but others did not, so we'll investigate some of the similarities and differences found among Native peoples. One final concept to keep in mind is the changing nature of Indian societies before and after European contact. Well before Europeans arrived in the Western Hemisphere, Native Americans adapted to their environment and Indian societies faced a great deal of changes. Historians and anthropologists continue to learn more about the origins of Native Americans each year. Some of those concepts will be discussed next. There are numerous theories and beliefs as to how Native Americans came to inhabit the Western Hemisphere. Some deal with religion and involve creation stories. However, many anthropologists and historians have other theories. Most believe that Native Americans lived in North America about 35,000 years ago. Just as other European colonists traveled here or migrated here, so too did Native Americans. They arrived via what came to be known as the Bering Land Bridge. The arrow on this map indicates where the Bering Land Bridge would have existed. It was there because the Earth experienced cooling trends and sea levels dropped between 250 and 300 feet. As the sea levels dropped, the area between what is now Alaska and Russia were actually connected by land. There would have been an ice-free corridor over which humans could have traveled. Specialists theorized these migrations would have taken place over many, many years as people migrated southward and eastward, probably in search of food. In addition to these theories offered by historians and anthropologists, different Native Americans had their own beliefs concerning their early roots. In many cases, rather than a story of migration, oral traditions place the origins of Indian peoples in the Western Hemisphere rather than somewhere else. If you're interested in learning more about these oral traditions, you may click on the hyperlink below. One of the most important traits concerning Native Americans would be the tremendous regional diversity among different American Indian groups. It would be difficult to describe life in detail for all Indian people living in what became the United States. However, for now, we'll briefly describe how some Mesoamerican civilizations impacted Native peoples who eventually lived in North America. The colors included in this map identify the different culture areas into which anthropologists have divided different Native American groups as of about 1500 AD. Notice the many different classifications used in the map. One of the most important traits influencing the development of the differences between Indian nations was the ability to produce food surpluses. This usually was associated with climate and particularly agriculture. While people first domesticated plants in the Middle East about 8,000 BC, in the Western Hemisphere it happened about 5,000 BC, not in North America but in Mesoamerica. This map identifies different Mesoamerican societies from about 1000 BC to the early 1500s. As crop surpluses were reached and elaborate trade networks developed, several large states were formed in different parts of what is now Mexico. The capital of one of the largest early states was Teotihuacan, which was located approximately 50 miles northeast of present-day Mexico City. Teotihuacan was founded about 300 BC. At its height, it boasted a population of approximately 100,000. It was a center for trade, and the trade networks extended throughout much of what is now Mexico, where one specialty was obsidian. It was also an important religious center as well, as shown here with its famous Sun Pyramid, the largest structure in the Americas until the Spanish arrived. Another major power in Mesoamerica were the Aztecs. The extent of their power is indicated by the light blue segments of this map. The Aztecs migrated from the north in the late 13th century and became a dominant power by the 1400s as they forced the people they conquered to pay large tributes. 
It's believed that approximately 300,000 people lived in the capital city of Tenochtitlan by the 15 teens, more than any city in Europe at that time. Here we see a drawing which depicts Tenochtitlan about 1519 at the height of Aztec civilization. It shows the great temple surrounded by several smaller pyramids. The Aztecs honored about 200 different deities. An elaborate irrigation system was established to drain marshlands, allowing farmers access to rich soil to produce crops for the huge population of the city. The drainage system also allowed for access to fresh water. At the time of the Spanish arrival, they were still expanding their empire in what is now Mexico. Now that we've explored some of the important Mesoamerican societies, we'll move northward to what is now referred to as the Southwest. As we do so, we'll focus on traits of several Native American groups at or immediately before the time of European contact. The Southwest is indicated by the brown segment of this map, which includes parts of what is now the American Southwest, as well as portions of modern-day northern Mexico. The Southwest is characterized by a very dry environment, but farming was important as more drought-resistant crops were introduced. The basket shown here was crafted by Anasazi artisans, who at one time became the most powerful people in the Southwest. Between about 900 and 1150, Anasazi culture reached its height. One community was located at Shaco Canyon, which included several towns. The region specialized in processing turquoise and became a major center for trade as it was located at the juncture of several road networks. Here we see an overview of Pueblo Bonito, which was the largest of the towns, numbering about 1,200. The towns were set up very carefully so as to allow roads to be perfectly straight as they extended many miles in several directions to facilitate trade and travel between different satellite communities. Classic Anasazi culture declined by the end of the 12th and 13th centuries due to a variety of factors, but it's believed the most important concern was drought. It had reached its height during an unusually high level of rainfall. Due to lack of adequate water for crops, the large settlements were forced to dissolve into smaller clans. Now we'll move farther east and explore the eastern woodlands. The eastern woodlands include the green regions as shown on this map. Overall, it encompassed areas from the Mississippi Valley to the Atlantic Ocean. Many different societies developed in this area, but one new culture emerged about 700 AD, referred to as the Mississippians. They were full-time farmers and in some cases lived in very large communities numbering in the thousands. The largest such community was named Cahokia, near present-day St. Louis, Missouri. Cahokia was located on rich farmland and included a very large area, about 125 square miles, and about 20,000 residents. They were famous for their large platform mounds surrounded by other religious temples and homes for chiefs. This painting conveys the grand scale of Cahokia. After 1200, Cahokia entered a period of decline as archaeologists believe a changing climate and an overtaxed environment led to a shortage of food and other resources. However, not until the 18th century would a North American city surpass the population of this metropolitan area. Now we'll explore another Indian group located in the eastern woodlands, but here we'll study a group as it lived at or about the time of European contact. The group to be studied were members of a confederacy of Indian tribes named the Iroquois. The Iroquois lived in the circled section of this map, essentially in parts of what is now western New York and Pennsylvania. The Iroquois included a unique political organization. They were not one Indian tribe, but in fact a confederation of five different tribes which included the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, and Seneca. In 1600 it's estimated they numbered about 10,000. According to Iroquois legend, this confederation began before European contact with the actions of a Mohawk sachem named Hiawatha. Prior to the creation of the confederation, there had been a great deal of warfare among the Indian tribes of the region, and Hiawatha had lost several family members. 
After several days of fasting in the woods, he received a vision, and was later able to develop a plan to eliminate the vengeance which was common when a family member died in combat. He also developed a plan which called for cooperation among the different Indian nations rather than conflict. Eventually, this made the Iroquois one of the strongest and most feared Indian groups in the eastern woodlands at the time of European contact. For more information about Hiawatha, you can click on the hyperlink below. Politically, the Iroquois made decisions using a council form of government. Delegates from each of the Indian tribes in the Confederacy attended council meetings to discuss issues until a consensus could be reached. The homes they lived in were longhouses. They were often about 25 feet in width, but could range up to 200 feet in length. Several families would live under the roof of one longhouse. This photo shows a partial reconstruction of an Iroquois town from the 16th century. Iroquois towns usually consisted of several rows of longhouses surrounded by a defensive wall. These were strong, weather-resistant living quarters, which included as many as three to five fireplaces to keep families inside warm on cold winter days. Baskets, pots, pelts, and food were also stored inside the longhouse. Several other traits were common among the Iroquois. Property was owned communally. Europeans commented that there was no need for poorhouses among the Iroquois because if a family didn't have enough, others shared with them. There was also a division of labor between men and women. Men hunted, fished, and were warriors. Women farmed and gathered food products. Farming was a key component of their food supply, as a great deal of their food came from agricultural goods. Because women were the farmers, and they relied so heavily on farmed products, this may explain why Iroquois women also held a great deal of political power. There are a few examples of the power held by Iroquois women. First, descent was matrilineal. In other words, unlike Europeans, children trace their ancestry through their mothers, not their fathers. This was easily seen when young couples were married. They would move to the longhouse of the bride's family. Secondly, women could easily divorce their husbands. A young man might learn his wife wanted a divorce as he returned from a trip to find his personal belongings outside his longhouse rather than within it. Finally, while women were not elected to the council positions, they selected the delegates who did represent their tribes and very much influenced debate. If a council delegate chose a position unpopular with the women, he might find himself recalled from that office. Next, we'll explore some of the characteristics concerning Native Americans living in what is now New England. In many ways, based on climate and geographic characteristics, New England can be divided into northern and southern regions. For our purposes, in general, the states included in northern New England include Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. The circled area on this map shows a close-up of northern New England. Indians living in northern New England lived exclusively as hunters and gatherers. This made life difficult because they were unable to preserve as much food throughout the year. To compensate, they practiced mobility. In the spring and summer months, they often lived in villages near the coastlines and relied on seafood to make up a large portion of their diet. In the fall and winter, they broke into smaller family units and moved to the interior where they depended more on hunting beaver and other larger game animals for food and pelts. They simply accepted the possibility that by late spring there may not be as much to eat as gathering food became more difficult and game animals became more scarce. Because they didn't have as much food, their numbers were smaller than those of their neighbors to the south. It's estimated the population of Native Americans living in northern New England was 15 to 20,000 in 1600. Indians living in southern New England lived in the area circled on this map, the present-day states of Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. Indians living in southern New England may not have lived far from their neighbors to the north, but their lifestyles contrasted. Instead of living strictly as hunters and gatherers, they also farmed. At times, over half of their diet came from farmed goods. This allowed them to store food for longer periods of time, so they didn't experience these starving times which often plagued Indians to the north in the late winter and early spring. Overall, even though the amount of territory included in both northern and southern New England were approximately the same, their numbers were larger than those who lived farther to the north, as you can see with these comparative population statistics. 
Farming practices among Native Americans living in southern New England and in other parts of North America differed from those employed by Europeans. In order to plant crops, fields needed to be cleared. Often, this was done by women who girdled trees and set fire to wood around the base of the trees to bring them down. In some instances, large areas of forested land were manipulated by the use of fire. On the side, you see an illustration depicting the so-called Three Sisters of Native American Agriculture, corn, beans, and squash. Usually, they were planted together in the same fields. This actually had many added benefits. Corn drew nutrients, like nitrogen from the soil, as beans added nitrogen. While this helped to delay soil exhaustion to some extent by clearing fields for agriculture and planting specific crops, Indians in southern New England had a major impact on their environment. Next, we'll focus on another American Indian group. These will be Native Americans living along the Pacific Northwest Coast. The area to be discussed began in southern Alaska, spreading along the west coast of British Columbia in both Washington and Oregon, all the way down to northern California. The first trait to be addressed is the fact that Pacific Northwest Coast Indians lived exclusively as hunters and gatherers. They didn't farm to obtain their food. Usually, if this was the case, people would have to work incredibly hard just to survive. However, there was such an abundance of food sources in the region that Pacific Northwest Coast Indians were incredibly wealthy compared to other Native Americans. For additional information about Indians of the Pacific Northwest Coast, you may click on the hyperlink below to a website sponsored by the University of Washington. One item contributing to this tremendous wealth would be the easy access to timber as a resource. Cedar trees in particular grew to tremendous sizes along the northwest coast and they added a great deal to the Indians' technology. These trees could often reach 250 feet in height while achieving a diameter of 18 feet. There were multiple uses of both the bark and lumber included in the tree. Bark was often used to make baskets and clothing. When soaked in water for a period of time, the bark would become quite soft and babies often wore diapers made from the bark of these cedar trees. Canoes were the primary mode of transportation, and canoes of all sizes were made from these enormous trees. Indians of the northwest coast also lived in longhouses, which were very large, permanent structures made of cedar. They housed many families, and could be as long as 100 feet in length and 40 feet wide. Seafood was the backbone of their diet, and in many cases salmon was the most important staple. Salmon could be caught in a variety of ways, but one of the most effective took place when they were spawning. Individuals in two canoes could paddle upstream while dragging a net between them to capture as many fish as possible. Once caught, they were prepared in a variety of ways. The key was to remove any moisture from the fish so they could be preserved for months. This was done by either smoking or drying the salmon. A typical meal might include smoked salmon dipped in oil. The key was abundance. Not only was there salmon, but many other fish. Shellfish, such as crabs, clams, and oysters, were also common. In some areas, whales were even hunted. Pacific Northwest Coastal Indian Society was very unique among Indian people. Society was very stratified. Each person occupied a different social rank. Even though their society was highly stratified, there were really only two social classes. Individuals were either free or slaves. In direct contrast to the Iroquois, who lived by more of a communal basis, Free people's position in Northwest Coastal Indian society was determined by an individual's wealth. Just as wealth plays an important role in determining one's place in American society today, it was crucial for Indians living along the Pacific Coast. This chart provides a bit of a visual aid to demonstrate rank in society. People at the top had the most wealth, and below those would be individuals who had less wealth. However, at the very bottom of this ladder were slaves. Occupation could also impact one's position in society. For example, among the whalers who lived along the Washington Peninsula, if an individual held a special skill, such as a harpooner, which was very prestigious, this could raise one's rank in society. This lecture has covered a wide range of subjects addressing Native Americans. It might be nice to review some of the most important concepts included. One important concept discussed in this lecture was the origin of native peoples in the Western Hemisphere. Beginning about 35,000 BC, humans slowly migrated to different regions in the Americas over a series of years. By the time of European contact, there was tremendous diversity among native peoples living in the area. 
Some farmed, while others did not, but access to local resources was important, just as it is today. Overall, you may want to be able to compare and contrast life for different Indians living in the Western Hemisphere and describe the important traits which differentiated these groups. Well, this completes lecture number one. I hope you learned something new today. The next few slides will identify some websites where you can find additional information concerning the subject as well as some of the sources used to create this presentation. Have a great day.